this is one of my like litmus test books for if you don't like it, there's something wrong with you and your reading taste, so. <laughs> Welcome back to my channel, you sexy prudes. My name's Charles, and today we will be talking about my favorite books of all time. This should be a pretty laid back, chatty video, just kind of what the books are about, why I like them, what the books are. I thought about doing some sort of like here are my top 10 books of all time, or top eight, or top seven, or whatever, to like really give it a number. But I ended up just going to my bookshelf and picking out all the books I really, really loved. The criteria for a book to make it into my favorites kind of came down to a sort of desert island criteria. Like which books would I be extremely happy to reread over and over again if I could only read those books? And that left Thirteen books and a bunch of honorable mentions. There's an honorable mention category because there truly are so many books that I love. I wouldn't still be reading if I hadn't found a lot of books that I truly, truly adore. Yeah, so I narrowed it down to 13. We will start with honorable mentions and then go from 13 up to my favorite book of all time. The ordering of the books, I almost didn't order them at all, but there is slight variations in my favorite books of all time, but not really. The, so the ranking is all but arbitrary, and I took like two minutes to rank the books. So especially between books that are right next to each other on the list, it's very arbitrary. I love all of these books. If you were expecting this list to be like this awesome eclectic collection of very niche books, you came to the wrong place. I have very basic taste. All of these books are extremely popular. <laughs> Everyone else who reads these books also loves them. This just happens to be my collection of extremely popular books. Let's get into it with the honorable mentions. First we have E.M. Forster's Where Angels Fear to Tread. I've also read Howard's End by E.M. Forster, and I love both of the books. I wouldn't say I love one more than the other. The reason that neither of them made it onto the favorites list is because they're just not on the same level as my favorite books, but I truly adore E.M. Forster, and I plan on reading all of his other books. I'm reading a collection of essays by him right now, and I'm really enjoying that. Yeah, but this book in particular is fantastic. I can't wait to read his other books. Forster's just so great at painting accurate pictures of real life people, and these books were written nearly a century ago now, and they're still so, so accurate. If you want scathing insights into humanity, uh, Forster's your guy. Forster has some very heavy hitting one-liners. I'll find one in this book and read it to you. I'll have cut it out in this video by the time I'm editing it, um, so you won't see the like minutes of me just paging through this book like a stone faced. I'll read you a couple. The horrible truth that wicked people are capable of love stood naked before her and her moral being was abashed. Here's another one. I seem fated to pass through the world without colliding with it or moving it, and I'm sure I can't tell you whether the fate's good or evil. I don't die, I don't fall in love. Here's one last quote. Settle it. Settle which side you'll fight on, but don't go talking about an honorable failure, which means simply not thinking and not acting at all. Forster's brilliant. One of the best writers I've ever read. I'll reread this book, I'm sure, if it shows you how much I love Forster. This is one of the only books I've written in. One of three books ever, like, annotated with a pen. Because I'll never get rid of this book. I will read it over and over again. Maybe in time it'll become one of my favorites, but right now I'm waiting to read the rest of his works and then pick out which one I guess would be my favorite of them. For books that I'm kind of hazy on, I'll read you the synopsis. Some of these books I remember the plot and it was extremely engaging and I love the books. Other books just left a very deep impression on me, but I don't quite remember remember the plot, which might seem kind of uh, ironic, and it is that these books are my favorite and I remember very few details, although if I started rereading them I'm sure that I would quickly be like, oh yeah, this, this, and this, but a lot of them are just these, in my mind, they're these very 
Anyway, here's what the back says. E.M. Forster's moving and wickedly funny first novel memorably engages his signature themes, the collision of cultures and the hypocrisy and snobbery of Edwardian England. I'm going to pause right there and say that it's not just that. Forster's critiques on humanity are not dependent on any knowledge or appreciation of Edwardian England. Anyway, here's the rest. Okay. I forgot. I'm not going to read the back of this because it spoils the entire book. So if you get this edition or another, I would be careful not to read the back. It's about a widow, a young English widow who runs off to Italy and marries this poor Italian guy and her in-laws, these aristocratic English people, are pissed. And it follows that dilemma. And some of the in-laws come and try and bring her back from Italy. And it's about individuality and following your desires and what it means to live and have beliefs. It's very broad stroke, what is humanity? And that's why I love Forster, because he does that fantastically. I just went and got another book from my bookshelf, so there are actually 14 books on my favorites. It's not an honorable mention. Uh, my other main honorable mention falls into a similar category to E.M. Forster. It's The Human Stain by Philip Roth. This is the only Philip Roth book I've ever read, but I plan on reading all of his other books because he's such an incredible writer. This book is pretty short, but... It took me a long time to read it because of how dense it is in terms of the ideas that Philip Roth presents and how amazing, I guess, the sentences are. He's a fantastic writer like Forster. I don't remember much of what The Human Stain is about. I know it's set in a New England town and it follows a professor who's accused of using a racial slur. It follows the witch crusade of the professor being ostracized and I'm pretty sure kicked out of the college. Philip Roth is an incredible incredible writer and like Ian Forster I plan on reading the rest of his books and then I'm sure one of his books will make it onto my favorite of all times in the future. Okay, let me do some rapid fire honorable mentions just because most of the books on my honorable mention rapid fire list are books that I just had a blast reading and that were really, really fun. Those being East of Eden by John Steinbeck. It has one of the most memorable female villains I've ever read. It's a long, long book, but it didn't feel like that because it was such a joy to read. Um, the Hobbit, great book. I still need to read uh, the Lord of the Rings trilogy. I've tried twice, but that was in like middle, early high school. So I'll give it another go. Valley of the Dolls by Jacqueline Suzanne. An amazing book that arguably should have made the list extremely engaging, thoughtful remarks on being an individual. And more broadly, it considers what any person wants out of life and the consequences of chasing fame, wealth, happiness, love. It's really, really good. The Picture of Dorian Gray by Oscar Wilde. I love that book. A few years ago, it would have been on my favorite list, it's just gotten bumped down a little bit, but it's fantastic, very well written. I love a good narcissistic book. Yeah, and if we're talking kids books, I love the Mysterious Benedict Society series, and I love a series of unfortunate events. Um, yeah, let's see, let's see, let's see, 13. Okay, on to the official list. In place 14, we have a Thousand Acres by Jane Smiley. I thought I'd hate this book. The only reason I picked it up is because I was on a Pulitzer Prize fiction binge and this won the Pulitzer Prize, I think in the late 80s, early 90s. It's about a farm. I hate Western novels. I hate this setting, but I love this book. It's incredible. It's a King Lear remake set on an Iowa farm, which I guess is Midwest, but... Whatever. I'll read you the back blurb. It's short. A successful Iowa farmer decides to divide his farm among his three daughters. When the youngest objects, she is cut out of the will. This sets off a chain of events that brings dark truths to light and explodes long suppressed emotions. An ambitious reimagining of Shakespeare's King Lear cast upon a typical American community in the late 20th century, A Thousand Acres takes on themes of truth, justice, love, and pride, and reveals the beautiful yet treacherous topography of humanity. It is. Amen. Great synopsis. The last 
phrase, the beautiful yet treacherous topography of humanity, is exactly why I love this book. It's a great phrase in general to describe some of my favorite books. You could probably apply it to most of these books. I love a book on humanity. I love a drama. This book was super gripping. Time says absorbing, exhilarating, and engrossing piece of fiction. Agree. I can't imagine someone reading this and not having a good time. You know, there's backstabbing and drama and good writing. What more could you ask from a book? A Thousand Acres. The next book also comes from my Pulitzer Prize binge. This one I'm pretty sure is from the 80s. Let me not mess that up again. This one might be 90, I don't know. But it's Alison Lurie's Foreign Affairs. I hate the new cover of this, but this is an old cover I bought on eBay used. I love this book. Like A Thousand Acres, it's a portrait of humanity. Um, this is actually a romance novel, which I'm not particularly inclined toward, but here's what the back says. Alison Lurie's Pulitzer Prize winning masterpiece is both a splendid comedy and poignant love story about two American academics in London. Virginia Minor, an unmarried, tenured professor, is an Anglophile on leave to research a book. Fred Turner, a teacher at the same university, is recently separated, flat broke, and miserable in this city where the rain never seems to end. The separate paths of these two lonely and naive innocents abroad lead them to strikingly similar destinations of newfound passion and unexpected love. By turn Turns hilarious and intensely moving, Foreign Affairs is a dazzling accomplishment. Timely, captivating, and unforgettable. Amen. This is a love story, or rather two love stories. There's an actress in this novel, I think, or like something like that. She does opera or plays or something, and she goes on this, she gets drunk and goes on this diatribe, and it's one of the most brutal things I've ever read, I'm pretty sure. I remember crying, like actually crying at the end of this book. It's very, very sad. It's engaging and truly an incisive portrait of humanity, like a ton of the books on my favorite books of all time list. I really recommend you read Foreign Affairs. I don't know why more people don't talk about it. The next book on this list is uh, a 180. It's The Da Vinci Code by Dan Brown. This is not an ironic pick. I'm not pranking you. I'm not, I'm not trying to be funny. I love Dan Brown. I love Dan Brown. I remember reading this in seventh grade and thinking that I had been enlightened, that everyone around me was just ignorant and that I needed to find the holy grail. And I remember being super obsessed. I tried to buy books on the Knights Templar and my mom would not buy them for me, which <laughs> crushed my obsession with the Knights Templar, but not with Dan Brown. Since reading The Da Vinci Code, I've come to read every other book he's written. I love all of them, kind of, but particularly the Robert Langdon ones. They're just so engaging and so much fun. They're thrillers, they're mysteries. Some of my favorites from him, he hasn't written that many books, but I love The Lost Symbol, Inferno's Great, The Da Vinci Code, obviously, Angels and Demons. Basically all of his Robert Langdon books I truly love. They're just so good. They're, they, I, I always read these books in like no time at all. I can't wait for the next one to come out. Dan Brown. The 11th book on this list, I think 11, I'm gonna butcher the counting or ranking, what can you do? But the 11th, I think, is a book I actually just finished this year and that's Brett Easton Ellis's The Shards. I've read American Psycho and I accidentally read the sequel to Less Than Zero, Imperial Bedrooms, without having first read Less Than Zero. I think American Psycho is a wonderful book, not like, Sunshine and Rainbows and Daisy's wonderful, but like very well done. It's just not, I didn't love it like I love The Shards, which is a thriller novel that follows a clique of high school kids in California and a serial killer in interactions between the two groups. It is truly eerie, extremely fast paced. I read this in maybe four days and it's like 500 pages. I always looked forward to picking up this book when I wasn't reading it. I was thinking about what would happen next. I had a blast reading this book. I love a good thriller. I just can't find many that 
I don't think are corny or annoying or poorly written. Yeah. Side note, Dan Brown's writing doesn't bother me. I finished all of his books, I mean, a few years ago now. Whenever the last, the most recent one came out, I read that one pretty immediately. I think it was maybe a little before COVID, but I don't remember his writing being bad. Brett Easton Ellis's writing is great. Great combination of insights into humanity and just a fun story. Um, the Shards is great. The next book, the 10th on this list is also a thriller. That book is Gone Girl by Gillian Flynn. I love Gone Girl. I also love Sharp Objects. I think Dark Places is not great, but I love Sharp Objects and I love Gone Girl. I remember I read this book on a trip with my family. I'd finished the books I brought and my mom brought Gone Girl. Even though this story is kind of a pop cultural phenomenon, very widely known. It was adapted into a movie. So many people have heard of it. I had not heard of it. All I knew is that I had finished my books and I wanted another one to read and one of the ones my mom brought was Gone Girl. I think I vaguely knew that Gone Girl was a thriller mystery, but apart from that, I knew absolutely nothing. I love Gillian Flynn's writing. I love the stories, extremely fast paced, very readable. This is like pioneering girl bossery. If you don't know anything about it, I recommend going in blind. The plot twist, mic drop. My jaw was on the floor when I got to it because I knew nothing about this book and I was like, oh, whatever, whatever, sure, cool. And then the plot twist happens and I was like, so if you haven't read Gone Girl or seen the movie or know the plot twist or whatever, I highly recommend you read it before anyone spoils it for you. Without reading the synopsis or anything else, um, if you like thrillers, there's no way you won't like this. It's such a good book. The next book, what is this, eight? This is the ninth book on my top books of all time. This is also a book I've read this year and made a video about. It is Tolstoy's Anna Karenina. This book I almost didn't put on the list because favorites are usually books I've read quite a bit a while ago and they've stuck with me, but I read this book in January and it stuck with me. Tolstoy probably has the best insights into humanity of any writer I've ever read. Reading character dialogue in the Anna Karenina truly feels voyeuristic because of how realistic the interactions are. Contrary to popular belief, Anna Karenina is not a hard novel to read. The sentences are not complex. They're very readable. There's not, the only barrier to entry, so to speak, is that it is so, so long. But apart from that, it's very, very easy to read. It's not highbrow. I'm pretty sure that Tolstoy actually scorned a lot of like highbrow literature or literature whose goal was to be highbrow. I particularly enjoyed Anna Karenina's character arc, but I loved all of the characters. Anna Karenina considers themes of individuality, happiness, love, your relationship to society, and they're all extremely well done. If you want a more in-depth review, of Anna Karenina and why you should read it, check out the video I made. Eighth on this list is A Game of Thrones. And if you're wondering why it's in this silly, tiny little book, it's because I read these books in high school. And so they're all at my parents' house. I saw this edition at Barnes and Noble and it was $20. And I was like, no way I'm paying $20. But I'm all for like, a silly little leather bound. They made a Hobbit version of this. And when I was in high school or middle school, I wanted it so bad, I never bought it. And I didn't buy this when it was $20 either. Cause I was like, that's ridiculous. I have the books, but then they discounted it to $10 and I still didn't buy it. And then it was $3 the next time I came. And so I paid $3 for this. About A Game of Thrones, it's just really engaging, very well written. I love a good evil character and the Lannisters are very evil. I love the wide host of characters and switching narrative perspectives. I love a drama. This book, or the five books, are a great time. I've been trying not to reread them, waiting for the sixth one, which uh, probably like everyone says, will never come out, but I can't wait to reread these books. Super gripping. I love them. I read them, all five of them, in a very short span of time. They're great. A Game of Thrones. The next book on this list is Endless Night by Agatha Christie. This book is half on here because 
of the book itself, which I love and I'll get to in a minute, but also half because Agatha Christie is one of my favorite authors. I love reading her books. They're such a comfort. I usually do an Agatha Christie binge every few months or so. But this one in particular, before I read Endless Night, The Murder of Roger Ackroyd was probably my favorite Agatha Christie. I started with and then there were none, which I love. But The Murder of Roger Ackroyd, all you need to know is that there's a major plot twist in The Murder of Roger Ackroyd and I was like, I really loved it. I love an Agatha Christie novel mostly for the atmosphere. Even the ones that aren't great I still love because I know what to expect and that either it'll be a great murder mystery or at the very least it'll be an atmosphere and writing style I like returning to. A lot of them are very logical murders like The Mysterious Affair at Styles. I don't know if it's her first novel overall but it's her first Hercule Poirot. Poirot. I still don't know how to say his name, but that one's very logical. The solution to the murder is logical. Some of them are a little like, but I still love them. I love Agatha Christie. Endless Night in particular is sort of an outlier in Agatha Christie's work. I was shocked at how much I love this novel. It's a romance novel. Well, kind of a romance novel. It's very eerie. It's a first person narration. It's unsettling and it ultimately like not very many other of Agatha Christie's works, it takes on the weight of considering what it means to be in love and what it means to love. Really, really great. It's really not like her other novels in that for the most part it is a romance between two characters, but the ending part... This book is very unsettling. I hope someone watching this has read it and you can let me know what you think. If you don't like Agatha Christie, this is a good one. Read Endless Night. I would love to know what someone who doesn't like Agatha Christie thinks of Endless Night because it is very different from her other novels. I love this book. The sixth book on this list I read last year and I think it was my top book of last year. It's The Great Believers by Rebecca Mackay. This book is heartbreaking. I cried. It's very, very sad. It's about the AIDS epidemic in the 80s, which going into the book, I knew pretty much nothing about. But like getting into the book, I don't know what else I expected than for it to be heartbreaking because like the obvious conclusion to the 1980s AIDS epidemic is like everybody dies. But this is a dual timeline between 2015 and the 1980s. In 2015, you follow the sister of one of the dead boys from the AIDS epidemic. And you know he's dead right off the bat. The book opens with, I think, the after party to his funeral. And then in the 80s, you follow Yale Tishman, who is an art curator or he works at a museum. And yeah, you follow his relationship, the AIDS crisis as it is unfolding. Very well written, very engaging, and super heartbreaking. I've never been so defeated over a book or just like destroyed, whatever. I know it's dramatic, but this book is very, very, very sad. She released another book, Rebecca Mackay, called I Have Some Questions For You, and I was thrilled to see that it was coming out. It's a murder mystery and it has a podcast and I was like, that sounds brilliant. And with her writing capabilities, I'm expecting the world because this, I like the writing in this and I thought it was very gripping. I have some questions for you came out in February and I planned to make a review of it because I thought I'd love it. And so I bought the book the day it was released, read it, and it was one of the worst books I've ever read. The writing was atrocious. It was shallow. It was ultra liberal in such a superficial way. It was awful. It was so, so bad. And that really put me into kind of a book spiral because I had loved the Great Believers so much. I do love it so much. It was my top book of 2023 and I have some questions for you. It was just so, so awful. And I was like, I don't wanna make a video about a book I hate, hate, hated when I loved her other one so much. It was just, things were getting bleak. So I scrapped the video and took a break from reading for a minute. Down to the final five. I love these books. These five books, I don't know, I, I don't know if they're in a league of their own. No, they're not. I love all of the books on this list. Coming in fifth, and, and I'm sure everyone's gonna like gun me down for no, you guys will gun me down for um, three on the list. But number five on this list is The Little Friend by Donna Tartt. This book has like 
a three-star rating on Goodreads, and every booktuber who I've seen review it does not like this book. It's fantastic. On the front, the New York Times book review calls it destined to become a special kind of classic. It grips you like a fairy tale but denies you the consoling assurance that it's all just make-believe, and that's a better synopsis than the back. I think a big reason why people get upset at The Little Friend is the book synopsis, which is superficially kind of what the book's about. But if you were to ascribe a kind of like actually what is this book about, the New York Times book reviews uh, blurb on the front is a better representation of that. Donna Tartt is my favorite writer of all time. The stories themselves are gripping and her writing is incredible. This follows a young girl named Harriet who is investigating the murder of her older brother, but the brother was killed when he was a little boy. He was found hanging from a tree, which is insanely eerie and gives the novel this very dark tension. 12 years after that, Harriet, who at that point is like, I think around 13 years old, you follow her investigating the murder and trying to figure out who did it. It's fantastic. It's such a gripping, well-written book. I think that the ending, which is what pisses a lot of people off, I was ambivalent about it at first, but as I marinated on it, I was like, that's brilliant. That's the only ending you can have to a book like this. I don't want to talk too much about it because it'll spoil it and the shock of the ending or lack thereof, it kind of adds to your overall ingestion of this book. So I would only read this book if you've read The Little Friend or The Goldfinch and love those and love them not for the plot, but for her writing. Then I would pick up The Little Friend. I remember reading this book when COVID first hit and everything shut down. I had to move back in with my family and it was like, it was stressful and upsetting to not get to see your friends or anyone else or whatever. And the little friend, to be like corny and annoying, was my friend throughout the first few months of COVID. I remember I would drive to Dunkin', get coffee, and then go sit in some abandoned mall parking lot and read the little friend. And it's one of my most treasured reading memories slash experiences. I can't wait to reread it. It is truly such like a world of a novel. It's not just a book, like it's a world you get to jump into. And Donna Tart does a great job of doing that. Okay, on to the fourth book. I also read this book last year. Oh my gosh. I said The Great Believers was my favorite book of last year, but uh, this book is higher up on the list. So I think I might have lied. The rankings have changed my actual favorite book of last year. I think I'm almost sure I read this last year. I did, I did, I did. Anyway, the book coming in at number four is Writers and Lovers by Lily King. This book is ostensibly very simple. I actually, I take that back. It is very simple, but that's not to say that it's not extremely well written, doesn't have great commentary on humanity, which I've said for nearly every book, but I told you I love a book about humanity and about love. It's super fast paced. It, it's great. It is a simple book. It's super short. The pages are like that with not very much written on them, but it packs a punch. And it was one of my most enjoyable reads ever. I can't wait to reread this. I could reread this over and over again. I, I don't know what to say more. Let me read you the back. Blindsided by her mother's sudden death and wrecked by a recent love affair, 31-year-old Casey Peabody has arrived in Cambridge, Massachusetts in the summer of 1997 without a plan beyond a determination to live a creative life. Written with King's trademark humor, heart, and intelligence, this is a transfixing novel that explores artistic passion, ambition, and the terrifying and exhilarating leap between the end of one phase of life and the beginning of another. Writers and Lovers is an unforgettable portrait of an artist as a young woman. It's great. It's brilliant. It's fun. It's so hard to do simple in such a profound way. A lot of writers try and be very intellectual and use very big words and make these complex run-on sentences. Um, and some of the writers on this list do like a run-on sentence, but they're not obnoxious or extravagant. They don't have these big words. Writers and Lovers is very simple, but incredibly well done. I'm sure I'm giving terrible reviews of all these books, but they're all so good. I recommend you read them. 
Now the one that people will probably gun me down for, um, this is also not an ironic, not meant to incite violence choice. That book is The Fountainhead by Ayn Rand. <laughs> um, I actually, this isn't the copy I read. I bought a library copy, which is like right there. Um, I didn't buy it. I checked it out and never returned it. <laughs> I love The Fountainhead. I think everyone would benefit from reading The Fountainhead. What The Fountainhead and Ayn Rand's philosophy is about is about the self and about being selfish, but not in the colloquial meaning of the word selfish. She means be selfish in a regard that everyone would benefit from taking to heart a bit. I guess I'll say part of how it differs from the colloquial sense is that Ayn Rand's selfishness does not involve putting other people down. That wouldn't be selfish because it's centered around other people, if that makes sense. Like if you're a, an Ayn Rand selfish person, you're not going around like backstabbing people and stuff because that goes against her philosophy of being an individual. I know nothing about politics. I'm truly ignorant when it comes to that. So I don't know how people wield Ayn Rand's philosophies in a political realm, but I remember reading a quote from Ayn Rand that was like, this book is not about politics. It's not about economics. It's just about being an individual. And I was like, amen, I agree. I can't wait to read Atlas Shrugged, which is like, it's not like, it is the follow-up to the Fountainhead, not in terms of uh, storyline, but in terms of uh, philosophy, it's the follow-up. I also thought the story was fun. I love Dominique. I think about her all the time. I also think about Howard Rourke all the time. I love them. I would be happy to reread this book for the rest of my life. It's an engaging story and the philosophies in it are truly great. I think anyone who disses on Ayn Rand has definitely not read any of her books, or at least The Fountainhead or Atlas Shrugged. And if they have, you haven't like truly read them or given them an opportunity. It took me forever to read The Fountainhead because each page, which is like decently sized, but it took me about five minutes per page to digest, which is a long time. But in order to like understand the philosophies and internalize them, you, you have to take your time with this book. I remember reading it right out of high school or it was my freshman year of college and and i know it's cliche but this book changed my life <laughs> um it changed how i perceived myself and others and my relationship to other people and my duty to other people and to myself it touches on artistic and intellectual integrity not touches on it like in large part is about it's great the the characters yeah it I don't know. The Fountainhead really did change my life. For the better. <laughs> For the better. Um, simply put, I, I guess, like, before I read The Fountainhead, I cared a lot about other people and pleasing other people and, like, doing things for other people and, and just for the sake of, like, external validation and external optics, I guess, like for other people. And that's what Ayn Rand means by being selfish, like to not do those things, to like live for yourself and your beliefs. At the same time that I don't believe in doing things for other people or like external validation, stuff like that. I also believe in treating people with kindness, just being a, a kind person. There are tons of mean people. And it's, it's funny because it's usually the people who are like, I treat people with kindness who are like assholes. Um, but I, I believe I believe in being nice. I think that not very many people are nice. My brand of kindness probably differs from a lot of other people's being that <laughs> a lot of people are superficially kind, but they're not honest, they're not loyal. I think honesty and loyalty are two of the biggest contributors to being a kind person. Um, yeah, I don't think being kind and being a supporter of Ayn Rand are mutually exclusive. I think they actually, they fit nicely together. And she explores that in this novel through Howard Rourke's relationship with Peter Keating. Yeah, I might do an in-depth video on Ayn Rand because I sound like a bimbo just like rambling about how I love philosophy and how it changed my life and stuff. But so I might do an in-depth video of Atlas Shrugged or reading it or 
annotating it or something like that. I love Ayn Rand. I think everyone should take the time to read and digest her book and they would be better off for it. Number two on this list is The Dutch House by Ann Patchett. Extremely fast paced, great commentary on humanity and heartbreaking. I also cried when I finished this book. I'm gonna just read you the synopsis for The Dutch House and move on. I think it's it says enough that this is second on my favorite books of all time list. At the end of the Second World War, Cyril Conroy combines luck and a single canny investment to build an immense real estate empire, propelling his family from poverty to enormous wealth. His first order of business is to buy the Dutch House, a lavish estate in the suburbs of Philadelphia. Meant as a surprise for his wife, the house sets in motion the undoing of everyone he loves. The story is told by Cyril's son, Danny, as he and his older sister, the brilliantly assert and self-assured Maeve are exiled by their stepmother from the house where they grew up. The two wealthy siblings are thrown back into the poverty their parents had escaped from and find that all they have to count on is each other. It is this unshakable bond that both saves their lives and thwarts their futures. Set over the course of five decades, the Dutch house is a dark fairy tale about two smart people who cannot overcome their past. Despite every outward sign of success, Danny and Maeve are truly comfortable only when they're together. Throughout their lives, they return to the well-worn narrative of what they've lost with humor and rage. But when at last they're forced to confront the people who left them behind, the relationship between an indulged brother and his ever-protective sister is finally tested. The Dutch House is a story of a paradise lost, a tour de force that digs deeply into questions of inheritance, love, forgiveness, how we want to see ourselves, and who we really are. It is filled with suspense, and though you may read it quickly to discover what happens, Danny and Maeve will stay with you for a very long time. Amen. I read this very quickly, and Maeve is one of the most memorable characters I've ever read. I think everyone should read The Dutch House. If you read The Dutch House and don't like it, I probably wouldn't like your reading taste. Or you. Um, hot take. This is one of my, like, litmus test books for if you don't like it, there's something wrong with you and your reading taste, so. That's my hottest take. Number one on this list is probably the most basic take of all time, and I don't care. It is... The Secret History by Donna Tartt. This book speaks for itself. I read this before. I read this before I blew up on TikTok. Um, I read this like right before. It was during my Pulitzer Prize binge. I was going through Pulitzer Prize novels and I was gonna read The Goldfinch. And then I looked at her other books and ended up reading The Secret History instead. I love this book. It's thrilling, it's engaging. The characters are a blast. It's extremely well written. I love a murder mystery. I think about this book all the time. I still remember all of the characters. Her books are truly universes, and I think that's what makes them so consoling, that you really truly get to experience a whole different world, which is why I and a lot of other kids start reading for that escapism factor. Like, why people read Harry Potter. I read Harry Potter, I love Harry Potter. For that same reason, I love Donna Tartt books, but Donna Tartt books are not only engaging, super fun worlds, they're also very, very well written. And that's a rare quality to come across. Donna Tartt books have coincidentally played such large roles in uncertain periods of my life. Like I said, I read The Little Friend when COVID first hit and that was a big consolation. It was a world I returned to over the course of months because when I find a book I really love, I start pacing myself instead of like flying through it, or at least with some books. And I did that with both The Little Friend and The Secret History. I loved Donna Tartt. I love these books. The only reason The Goldfinch isn't on this list is because I haven't read it yet. I don't want to be done with Donna Tartt per se. Not that reading The Goldfinch would make me done with her because I would just then continue to reread the books, but I like having something to look forward to, I guess. Like if I'm ever at a point where I'm just so fed up with reading, I know that there is one book that I haven't read that there is almost a near certain guarantee I will love and will reinvigorate my love of reading. And that's kind of what The Goldfinch is for me. So I haven't read it. And because my reading habits are still alive and well in the grand scheme of things, I don't want to read it yet. Does that make sense? Do you guys have a book like that? That concludes my favorite books of all time video. I hope you enjoyed
talking about, being talked at about my favorite books. Comment if you've read any of these books. I know you have because these books are not niche. Uh, let me know if you hated any of these books or me. Like, subscribe. Yeah, maybe see you here same time, same place next week. Okay, that's all for now. See you soon.